Hi students, I welcome you all for a very interesting topic of intestinal obstruction. This topic is very important as it has a great weightage in the MCQs which are asked. Mechanical small bowel obstruction is the most frequently seen surgical emergency. It can be classified depending on etiopathology as dynamic or plastic or dynamic. Depending on the site of obstruction, it can be classified as proximal small bowel, distal small bowel, or large bowel obstruction. Other classification include simple obstruction where the blood supply is intact, strangulated obstruction where there is direct interference to the blood flow, and closed loop obstruction where both limbs are obstructed as seen in hernia. Now we'll see dynamic obstruction where peristalsis is working against a mechanical obstruction. The obstructing lesions may be intraluminal that is within the lumen as we see in roundworms, muconium ileus or gallstones. Second lesion can be intramural that is in the wall as in malignancy, tubercular stricture or Crohn's disease and extramural that is the outside wall. Example, intraperitoneal bands and adhesions, hernias, volvulus or intussusception. A dynamic obstruction in this mechanical element is absent. It can be seen in two forms where peristalsis is absent or it is present. In first form, that is when peristalsis is absent, example paralytic ileus which is seen most commonly in post-operative periods or it can be caused by uremia, hypokalemia or as seen in spinal injuries, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Second form is where peristalsis is present or in non-propulsive form. Example, mesenteric vascular occlusion or pseudo-obstruction. The other common causes of intestinal obstructions are mainly adhesions, second is malignancy, third hernias which can be external or internal, then comes inflammatory bowel disease, fecal impaction, volubilis, intussusception, and in neonates, atresia. Pathophysiology of obstruction. When the obstruction sets in, gas and fluid accumulates proximal to the site of obstruction. Gas is mainly seen from the swallowed air. Some also is produced in the intestine by the bacterial reaction. Fluid is swallowed liquids and the gastrointestinal secretions. Slowly the bowel starts distending. Intraluminal and intramural pressure rises. Microvascular perfusion is impaired, leading to intestinal ischemia that follows necrosis and then the strangulating bowel obstruction is seen. When it is partial small bowel obstruction, only a portion of lumen is occluded, allowing passage of some gas and fluid. The progression of event occurs more slowly than with a complete small bowel obstruction and so development of strangulation is less likely. In contrast, progression to strangulation occurs especially rapidly with the closed loop obstruction. In this segment of intestine, the obstruction is seen both proximally and distally. In this, the accumulated gas and fluid cannot escape either proximally or distally from the obstructed segment. A classic form of closed loop obstruction is a tight carcinomatous stricture of the colon with competent ileocecal wall. If unrelieved, this will result in necrosis and perforation and perforation will happen at the cecum. As we can see in this diagram, this is the transverse colon, ascending colon and ileum. This is the ileocecal junction. If the ileocecal wall is competent and there is a stricture, carcinomatous stricture at the transverse colon, the back pressure will rise, cecum will get distended and finally perforation will result in the cecum. This is called as closed loop obstruction. The other closed loop obstruction can be seen as in hernia, where the hernia loop is up absolutely obstructed and then we can see that the gas and fluid accumulates in the loop 
and perforation can happen. Hernia and the cecum, these two are the examples of closed loop obstruction. Clinical features of the obstruction, the classic symptoms are colicky pain, distension of abdomen, vomiting and absolute constipation. Symptoms will differ depending on the age of the obstruction, the underlying pathology, the presence or absence of interstitial ischemia and site of obstruction, depending on proximal or distal small intestine or large intestine. As we can see in the slide, proximal small bowel obstruction in that vomiting will be early and profuse with rapid dehydration, distension will be minimum and you can see very less fluid levels on the abdominal radiograph. Distal small bowel obstruction, pain is predominant with central distension, vomiting is delayed and multiple central fluid levels are seen on the radiograph. Large bowel obstruction, distension is early and pronounced, pain is mild, vomiting and dehydration is late and proximal colon and cecum are distended on x-ray of abdomen. Late manifestations that will be seen are dehydration, oliguria, hypovolemic shock, pyrexia, respiratory embarrassment, peritonism and finally septicemia. Strangulation. It is vital to distinguish strangulation as it is a surgical emergency. Diagnosis is entirely clinical. Shock indicates underlying ischemia. Pain is never absent. Localized tenderness associated with rigidity and rebound tenderness is seen. Diagnosis is very important and the goals are distinguish mechanical obstruction from ileus, to determine the etiology of obstruction, to differentiate partial from complete obstruction and to discriminate simple from strangulating obstruction. Now in examination, meticulous search for hernias, particularly inguinal and femoral hernia should be done. On lab, hemoconcentration and electrolyte abnormalities will be seen. As we can see that there will be vomiting. So hemoconcentration and electrolyte abnormalities. Mild leukocytosis is common. Presence of gross or occult blood in stool is suggestive of intestinal strangulation. The diagnosis is mainly confirmed with radiographic examination. X-ray erect abdomen is the investigation of choice. The finding most specific for small bowel obstruction is the triad of dilated small bowel loops, which will be more than 3 cm in diameter, air fluid levels will be seen and paucity of air in the colon. Now this is the very important question which is asked in the MCQs that which is the only investigation which will give you diagnosis of the intestinal obstruction and of course the answer will be x-ray erect abdomen. Features. Small bowel will show straight segments generally central and right transversely. No gas seen in the colon. The jejunum will show valve conenmentis that completely pass across the width of the bowel and regularly spaced giving a concertina or step ladder effect. Ileum is featureless. Cecum will show rounded gas shadow in the right iliac fossa and large bowel will show hostile folds or hostrations. Fluid levels appear later than the gas shadow as it takes time for fluid and gas to separate. In infants less than 2 years of age, a few fluid levels are commonly seen in the small bowel. In adults, two inconstant fluid levels may be regarded as normal. These are one at the duodenal cap and second at the terminal ileum. Computer tomographic that is CT scan is 80 to 90 percent sensitive and 70 to 90 percent specific. The findings which are shown on CT are a discrete transition show zone with dilation of bowel proximally, decompression of bowel distally, intraluminal contrast that does not pass beyond the transition zone and a colon containing little gas or very little fluid. 
but strangulation in CT will be seen as thickening of bowel wall, nematosis intestinalis that means air in the bowel wall, portal venal gas, mesenteric haziness, poor uptake of intravenous contrast into the wall of the affected bowel. CT scan can give you etiology of obstruction. The treatment. The treatment of obstruction. There are three measures. First is the gastrointestinal drainage. Second will be fluid and electrolyte replacement. And third will be surgical intervention. The surgical treatment is necessary for most cases of intestinal obstruction but should be delayed until resuscitation is complete provided there is no sign of strangulation and no evidence of closed loop obstruction. In obstruction secondary to adhesions, conservative management may be continued for up to 72 hours in the hope of spontaneous resolution. In the site of obstruction is unknown. Adequate exposure is best achieved by midline incision. Operative assessment is directed to site of obstruction, nature of obstruction and the viability of the gut.